Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Pacific Historic Parks History Talks. I'm Weston, the Education and Interpretation Coordinator for Pacific Historic Parks. We are the nonprofit organization who works in partnership with the National Park Service. And together we support the Pearl Harbor National Memorial in Hawaii, home of the USS Arizona Memorial, Warner Pacific National Historical Park in Guam, American Memorial Park in Saipan, Kalapapa National Historical Park in Molokai, and Diamond Head State Monument on the island of Oahu. And our mission is to remember, honor, and understand World War II in the Pacific. And History Talks is the interactive series designed to share history and stories of Pearl Harbor and World War II in the Pacific. And conducting today's program is Pacific Historic Park's Director of Communication, who has years of experience in the newsroom. That is James years. McCoy, <laughs> Jim McCoy. But, you know, today, the real main people, of course, is today we are honored to be speaking with the National Montford Point Marine Association and their current president, Dr. James T. Everhart Jr., who retired from the Pentagon as head of Marine Corps uh, Correction Branch, and also the 16th president of the association, Joseph H. Geeter III, about the Marines of Montford Point and their involvement in World War II and beyond. Gentlemen, take it away. Thank you, Weston. Thank you very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure and an honor to uh, have these gentlemen on. Uh, let's start with Dr. Haverhart uh, with the first question, basic question, who are the Montford Point, Point Marines, sir? Thank you all, first of all, uh, for hosting this event and for all uh, the guests in attendance. I thank you all for coming aboard. You know, the story of the Montford Point Marines, uh, Montford Point Marines is a story of resilience, a story of perseverance. You know, it goes back to January, uh, June the 25th of 1941, when President Franklin D. Roosevelt issued Executive Order 8802, establishing the fair employment practice that began the, to erase discrimination in the armed forces. The Marshall Point Marines are the first African Americans who trained at the segregated base uh, alongside at Cap Lejeune, North Carolina. When most people think about the Marshall Point Marines, they think about in their boot camp training. You know, these Marines did not train at San Diego, California, or at Paris Island, South Carolina. These men trained at Camp Marple Point. During the periods of 1942 to 1949, approximately 20,000 African American African American civilians would transform and become Marines at that very segregated camp during that time frame. The first African American to set foot on that segregated base in which we call the hollow grounds was Howard P. Perry during that time frame. Uh, 20 years later, you know, that's when our association was starting. We'll talk about that a little, a little later. Well, thank you very much. Uh, um, uh, moving on to uh, Mr. Geeter. Uh, since our mission out here in uh, Hawaii is uh, World War II in the Pacific, uh, can you tell us uh, some of the service the Montfort Point Marines had in, in, in the Pacific in World War II? All right, well, thank you, Jim. And Dr. Everhart laid the groundwork on who these Moffa Pointers were. Uh, after they finished their training, their segregated training at Moffa Point Camp, again, starting in 1942, uh, many of them started receiving their mission orders and started headed west to California, uh, specifically the San Diego area, to continue on west to Hawaii uh, as a staging area before they got involved in the Pacific Campaign. Uh, we all know the dates. We know December 7th, 1941, that day of infamy where we entered the war. But that was in 1941. Uh, we were really at war in 1942. The first major battle, I believe, was Guadalcanal, uh, which took place uh, in August of 1942. Uh, well, while Guadalcanal was raging in the Pacific, the Moffa Pointers were just starting to enter their recruit training. So they didn't get, didn't get involved in the early part of the war. But their time was coming. Uh, the first Moffa Pointers to actually see combat were those Moffa Pointers attached um, to the Marines and the Battle of Saipan. Uh, which began on 15 June uh, 1944. So many members of the Moffa Point uh, Ammo and Depot companies actually landed on Saipan on D-Day. So they landed uh, along with the, the regular troops, the regular infantry troops, because when you land, you need the combat service support, the logistics, the, the ammunition, and all the things that you need to fight uh, right next to you, right behind you, or sometimes right in front of you. Um, so they saw action on Saipan. Uh, the first Moffa Point in, injured, or the first two injured, was a Corporal Love and a Sergeant Timberlake uh, Curvin. Uh, they awarded the Purple Heart uh, for actions for wounds received in action on Saipan. 
Uh, as the Marines continued to um, island, island hop uh, through the Pacific, the Moffa Pointers were there with them. Um, many of the white Marines did not even know uh, that there were blacks in the Marine Corps. So when they get on a ship and they see these African-Americans in uniform, a lot of them had questions about, you know, who are you guys and, and how did you get on our ship? Uh, but when they found out, when they found themselves in combat, uh, my old friend Ken Roddick, who saw combat on Saipan, uh, said they became buddies quick because they realized that they needed each other to survive this combat, this war, and the experiences they was going through. So the Moffa Pointers fought in Saipan. Uh, their next uh, battle uh, was Peleliu, and Peleliu um, started on 15 September 1944. So the Moffa Pointers took part in that and actually saved a group of uh, uh, a white Marine unit. They call them the Black Angels of Peleliu uh, because they came out of nowhere and really kind of saved, uh, uh, saved some, some Marines from being annihilated. Um, the Marines continued on to Iwo Jima, uh, despite what you see in some of the movies. We were there at Iwo Jima. Uh, as a matter of fact, members of the 8th Ammo Company and 36th Depot Company uh, landed on D-Day, uh, February 19, 1945, at Red Beach on Okinawa. Uh, approximately 900 African-American men uh, served in the Battle of Iwo Jima. Uh, but that wasn't their largest battle. Uh, the largest battle was the largest, uh, was the final uh, big battle of World War II. Too, and that was the fight for the island of Okinawa, uh, which started on April 1st, April Fool's Day in 1945. And during the Battle of Okinawa, some 2,000 Mafopoi Marines served in combat during that battle. And that represented the largest uh, concentration of African American Marines to fight in the Pacific. Uh, after World Wars, um, um, the war um, was over, I guess, after the atom bombs were dropped, uh, Mafopoi stayed in the, in the region, in the theater. Um, to kind of clean up the nuclear uh, fallout for that. So there was a Sasebo, Japan, and other locations throughout Japan uh, to help um, transition from a wartime effort uh, to mainly an occupation effort. So Moffa Pointers were in the Pacific starting again in 19, the, the last two years of the war, um, 44 and 45, and they fought gallantly. Some of them received some high honors like Luther Woodward on, uh, on the Battle of Guam. After the battle was over, he was standing guard at an ammo dump because they were ammunition bearers and, and, and the like there. And he found some, some footprints um, that belonged to a Japanese soldiers. So he followed the footprints into the jungle and uh, came up on, a, on some Japanese. And I believe he killed one and realized he was out there by himself. So he went back to the encampment and told his fellow Moffa Point Marines, hey, I think I got something here, uh, follow me. Uh, and so him and some fellow Moffa Pointers went back out into the jungle and they found those Japanese and, and killed and captured, I believe all of them. And for his actions there, Luther Woodward was awarded the Silver Star for Valor for his action there. So, so we were there in the Pacific. Thank you. The, um, we've just been noticing in the last few months those anniversaries of those battles coming by, and we uh, we, we pay a lot of attention to that. Iwo Jima particularly was, as you say, was uh, was a, uh, was pretty fierce. Um, so, um, moving back on to uh, Dr. Everhart. Uh, the, Monfort, the National Montford Point Marine Association, um, what is that? So the National Montford Point Marine Association basically started 20 years after World War II in the summer of 1965. A group of uh, enterprising group of uh, Marine veterans, African-American, residing in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, formulated a plan to hold a reunion. These men had not seen each other for, again, well over 20 years after, after World War II. They met in Philadelphia, and you know, from September 17th and 18th of 1965, over 400 uh, former and active duty Marines represented 17 states attended the reunion at, at the Adelphi Hotel during that time frame. In which, afterwards, we started the they started an association, and today our association boasts well over 42 chapters, and we are definitely looking forward to opening or uh, starting a new chapter in Las Vegas in the very near future. Our mission and purpose solely is that, to perpetuate the legacy of the first African-American Marines who entered the, uh, the United States Marine Corps during 1942. And we try to uh, promote the, the goodwill and service to the youth and the growing uh, population of our senior <clears throat> citizens and establish uh, strong bonds of uh, friendship uh, in adversity, through shared adversities in our communities. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, we're going to now show a, a short video about the Montfort Point Marines, and I'll give that back to Weston. Okay, Jim, if I could tee up that video, if you don't mind. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Mr. Geek. 
Okay, the audience is about to see a video. Um, there are a lot of videos that have been made specifically in the last 10 years about the Moffa Pointers since they were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal. And we'll talk about that later. Um, but the commandant in this video is the commandant of Marine Corps at the time. His name was James Amos, and this Sergeant Major is there as well. Uh, and they talk about some of the background historical things that Dr. Everhart mentioned. But this video is significant because this is the top guy in the Marine Corps at the time talking about Moffa Point. Such was not the case in 1942 when Thomas Holcomb uh, was coming out of the Marine Corps and really didn't want to um, receive African Americans in the Marine Corps. As a matter of fact, he was quoted as saying, if it was a choice of 250,000 blacks or 5,000 whites in the Marine Corps, I'd rather have the whites. Uh, so that was the attitude that these Moffa Pointers uh, walked into in 1942. And it wasn't until 1944, uh, during the aforementioned Battle of Saipan, when the Moffa Pointers proved themselves in battles, that the then commandant, A.A. Vandegrift, made the statement that the Negro Marine is no longer on trial. They are a Marines, period. And since that time, the Marine Corps has had an up and down relationship with the Moffa Pointers. So it wasn't until General Amos really got on board with the association to seek recognition for these Moffa Pointers um, then, um, that we received the recognition that we're receiving today. And this eight minute video tells a good story about that. But General Amos was definitely, and his Sergeant Major, Sergeant Major Barrett, uh, were definitely uh, access to the Moffa Pointers Association. So let's watch the video. The spirit of our Corps, embodied in the Eagle Globe and Anchor, lives within the soul of every Marine. This spirit is born through arduous rite of passage at boot camp and officer training, after which a young man or woman is called a United States Marine for the first time. Our ethos has been shaped by ordinary men and women Patriots who showed extraordinary leadership and courage, both physical and moral. From 1942 to 1949, approximately 20,000 African American men enlisted in the Marine Corps at a time when our nation was at war and the country and military services were resistant to integration. They came from the North and from the South, from all walks of life. They came for different reasons. Some wanted the challenge of being a Marine, some wanted to earn a living, but all came to protect and serve their country honorably. They arrived on a rugged and heavily wooded five and a half acre site near Jacksonville, North Carolina called Montford Point. The first group of these pioneering Marines built the now famous camp of wooden huts. Others that followed fell in on their handiwork. They braved a variety of threats, everything from the swagger sticks of tough drill instructors to the snakes and the mosquitoes and even those bears that inhabited the land. In many cases, they were challenged harder than their white counterparts, entering the Corps at the same time. These brave Marines served with honor during a critical period in our nation's history, fighting in some of the bloodiest struggles in the Pacific, Saipan, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. Some died in these epic island battles. Many others continued their service in the codes of Korea and the jungles of Vietnam. Many Montford Point veterans, men like Gilbert Hashmark Johnson, Edgar Huff and Frederick C. Branch are now legends in the rich history of the Marine Corps. In 19 June of 1942, I saw a newspaper article to the effect that the Marine Corps had begun accepting Negroes for service with the Corps. Well, you know, you can't uh, think of being a Marine without thinking about the Marfa Pointers because they are the beginning. Um, you often question yourself, could I have done that? Could I have had the perseverance to come and to join an organization, first that didn't want you, two, that had the history of being the last service to, do, to integration? The Marine Corps basically, in the early days, were looking for the best black men that they could find four corners of the country. Uh, we had men coming in uh, who had their degrees. Some had both their degrees and had a couple of years in vocation. We call them the mighty platoon. We knew we were being trained harder. And of course, the Diaz would tell us that, uh, you know, they're going to make us superior to all, all of the other of white Marines, particularly. In fact, as a matter of fact, we were breaking every record that they ever had because they pushed us to the end of our endurance to where we just couldn't go any further. You think about where they came and why they came. 
Uh, many of them were doing just fine where they are. Some were educators, uh, some were professional ball players, some even owned their own business. Some were farmers and some were just working in factories. But they came because they felt in their heart of hearts that our nation needed their support, needed them to be a part of what was good about America. And a lot of them felt that when they came, uh, when they provided their contributions, that somehow that they would convince the world as well as America that they had earned the right to all of the rights and privileges there are being Americans. I went in, in late enough and we had all uh, white officers, but we had black drill instructors. Hatchbox Johnson was, was much older than, than we were. He had spent about three tours in the Army, and he came and he had about two tours in the Navy. And that's, that's how he got to be called Hashbach. He got to service here, earned service stripes. So he had about three of them, I think. Hashbach was uh, a very strong disciplinarian. In contrast, Huff was uh, about twice the size of Hashbach. And Huff was a big guy. And whereas Hashbach would issue uh, stern disciplinary kinds of uh, orders, Huff would uh, walk up to you softly and knock you on the, on the deck if you didn't comply. I left home to join the Marine Corps. And uh, when I joined the Marine Corps, when I got to uh, Mumford Point, I had 25 cents in my pocket. That's all I had. In the last suit, I uh, had it on. And uh, I came to the Marine Corps to stay. Uh, Huff was strictly a, wasn't on the D.I. He was a tough guy, tall, big, and strong. And so when he spoke to you, you moved. You, you, you didn't dare say anything because, you know, like I said, you were at his mercy. As I said, they could do anything they wanted to do, and they did. The Marine Corps today is much better than it was for, for the minority. I see sergeants, majors, I see uh, generals, colonels. When I got out of the Marine Corps, there was only one lieutenant. Remember when they came in, there was no black officers at all. Matter of fact, when Fred Branch in 1945 was the first African American commissioned, he did one of the stipulations that he had to come from the Moffett Point Marines. But I always look at the photograph of Fred receiving his uh, second lieutenant commission, the big smile on his face and his lovely lady beside him. Uh, I have a pretty good idea what Fred went through, but I have no idea what his personal experiences were. Given the times, I just have to assume that Fred caught hell. Now we've got generals with three stars, so that's a big change. And then myself, when I, when I went as a, as a private, I never had any concept that we'd ever have a black officer, and yet I became one of them. Uh, there's no question. I, especially after I had an opportunity to meet them and become a part of them and be mentored by them, that when you listen to their stories of their struggles and the things that they did, and more particularly the things that they did to overcome adversity, they were all tools that I put in my kit bag. And, uh, and as I came up, as I matured through the Marine Corps and encountered some of the similar things that they did, but nothing, nothing at all close to what they had been through in the 40s, um, you know, I would remember things that they said, things they did, uh, and use it in, in, to help me. The, one of the things they taught me was, you know, if you're focused on your mission, if you know what you want to do, uh, nobody can stop you from doing that. So you, you want to think that when you step into the footsteps of these giants and the legacy for which they have left you, that you measure up. And so that's, that inspiration is beyond words um, because of what they have done as a part of that fabric of the creating America history. And they tell me <laughs> that they're climbing up on my shoulders but they did the work. They did the work. And I'm very proud of them. It's the responsibility of the Marine Corps to anchor the story of Montford Point in the annals of the Marine Corps' rich history. Every Marine, from private to general, should know the history of the Montford Point Marines, who crossed the threshold to fight not only the enemy they were to know overseas, but that of racism and segregation in their very own country. Collectively, they paved the way for the many thousands of Marines of various backgrounds, men and women alike, who serve our nation today with honor, courage, and commitment.
Ah. Thank you, Joe. That was that was very inspirational. Um, I have a question. Uh, some of those gentlemen who were interviewed, uh, Bass Marines, uh, are some are they still with us, or have they passed on some of them? And I'm I'm glad you asked that question because that's exactly what I was going to talk on afterwards. Uh, every mop appointed that you saw in that video is now um, guarding the gates of heaven. Uh, the last person you saw was Ken Rollick. He was one of the members um, that landed on Saipan on 15 June. Uh, the first individual you saw was Gene Doherty. Uh, Gene Doherty um, turned 19 on, on, I believe, February 19, 1945, when he was with 8th Ammo Company and landed on Iwo Jima. Uh, the officer you saw, Lieutenant um, Colonel Joseph Carpenter, uh, was one of our founding fathers and one of the founding fathers of our Washington, D.C. chapter and was instrumental uh, in the Congressional Gold Medal. And I'll talk more on him uh, when I get that question. Uh, Follow-up question, though. How many Hanford Point Marines are still with us? Another great question. Uh, and 10 years ago, we had 400, approximately 400 uh, living Moffa Point is out of the approximately 20,000 that went through Moffa Point. Uh, at Emancipation Hall in the U.S. Capitol for the presentation of the Congressional Gold Medal. Uh, since that time, 10 years ago, uh, we lost about a dozen of them uh, within a couple of weeks after that ceremony because many of them were holding on uh, for that glorious day. But since that time, for almost every person we've lost, we found another living one. We found two living mop appointers just this past week. Uh, so the answer to your question is we believe there are still approximately 400 out of the 20,000 African-Americans who went through Moffa Point Camp still living today, about 400. You mentioned the Congressional Gold Medal. Can we talk about that? What was that process like? Was it, uh, uh, tell us the history of it. Well, I tell you what, back in 2005, I was elected national president. I uh, preceded Dr. Everhart. And about halfway during my presidency, my administration, really at the end of my first term in 2007, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen, were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal for their service during World War II. And the Tuskegee Airmen is a household name, it pretty much is, and kind of everybody kind of knew when, um, and when they were recognized that they were deserving of that recognition. Well, the Moffa Point has always felt they were being held second fiddle to the Tuskegee Airmen and the Buffalo Soldiers. So we had a few Moffa Pointers that were quite vocal about this. Uh, one of them was First Sergeant uh, James Rudy Carter down in the Tidewater area of Virginia. And when he saw on TV that, that President Bush was awarding a Congressional Gold Medal to the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, he called me up. Uh, he said, Mr. President, the Tuskegee Airmen are, are, are ahead of us again. Uh, what are you going to do about it? Uh, so it was a challenge. And, and me and my, you know, forward thinking or no thinking, uh, I made a promise to Rudy that I was going to give him a Congressional Gold Medal. And so I started working on that in 2006. Uh, and right around 2007, uh, we finally got introduced to some people in the Congressional Black Caucus uh, who really opened up the door for us to start our lobbying effort for the Congressional Gold Medal. And that effort started in the office of uh, Representative Corrine Brown out of, the, out of Florida, out of uh, North Florida. Uh, so she introduced me, Corrine Brown introduced me to almost anybody I wanted to meet uh, down in Congress. And we literally uh, went door to door uh, lobbying for the medal. And I gave a presentation in September 2007 to members of the Congressional Black Caucus. And that's when Kareem Brown asked me if she could be our main sponsor for the bill. So we went through a whole bunch of lobbying. At this time, I decided not to seek a third term. And Dr. Everhart was an up and coming senior regional vice president. So he decided to run for president. And upon him being elected president, he appointed me as national legislative officer and national public relations officer. So I would have a couple of titles you know, on my sleeve when I'm knocking on doors in DC. So. All said and done, um, Colonel Carpenter and myself made over 50 trips uh, to where I, well, I made the trip to Washington, D.C. He actually lived in Washington, D.C. So when I went to D.C., I would meet up with Colonel Carpenter and he would get me to the Capitol, the convention center or to some hotel for a reception or wherever we had to be to kind of lobby for the gold medal. Um, Dr. Everhart is now at the helm and he put together the Congressional Gold Medal team. Um, and Dr. Everhart lobbied with me side by side. He can uh, tell you we had some 12 hour days uh, at the Capitol knocking on door to door and trying to get the message out. Uh, but when General Amos, uh, James Amos, who you saw in the video, when he found out about our lobbying efforts, at first he was a little upset uh, because we didn't really consult with him. We just did it uh, like Marines do. But he reminded us that he had a legislation team in the Capitol and he put that team at our disposal. And when he spoke at our national convention, the Moffa Point Marine Convention in Atlanta in 2011, 
that's when the doors really open up. Uh, the national president, Dr. Everhart, went on CNN TV with an original Moffat Pointer, Ambassador of Theodore Britton, and that's when the floodgates really opened. Uh, once we got that national exposure, the commandant decided to hold a parade in their honor in August of 2011 just to bring more recognition uh, to the Moffat Pointers, and, and it worked. Uh, because the bill that we have been lobbying for for over four years finally came to the House, the U.S. House, uh, to the floor for a vote in October, October 25th in 2011. And when the vote was all said and done, Dr. Everhart and I was on the phone during the vote on C-SPAN and, and getting excited like we was watching the Super Bowl game. Uh, the final vote was actually 422 to zero. Uh, it was the most nonpartisan piece of legislation that had been passed in years and years. And then a few weeks later, it went to the floor of the Senate well, we now had the late Senator Kay Hagan as our major sponsor. She brought to the floor of the Senate on November, I believe, November 9th, 2011. And once the Senate passed it, um, then President Barack Obama signed Public Law 112.59 into law on November 23rd, 2011. So 10 years ago, this coming June, uh, will be our 10th anniversary since the presentation of the Congressional Gold Medal. But since that time, of the 20,000, approximately 20,000 men, and they were all men then, who went through Moffa Point Camp, we've only awarded about 2,000 gold medal replicas to them or their families. So we're constantly on the lookout for Moffa Point Marines, and, and I'll mention it later, but we do have a website, uh, www.mofferpoint, M-O-N-T-F-O-R-D, moffapointmarines.org, and it can show you our latest uh, efforts to recognize the families. Dr. Everhard did a public service announcement, or PSA, um, back in August of last year that's been floating around social media now for almost a year. And we're constantly, I am constantly, and I mean constantly, almost um, almost every day of every week, I get some kind of inquiry in, and I've got four congressional gold medals on my dining room table right now on standing by to be awarded. So um, slowly but surely, we're getting the word out, but we still got a lot of work to do to get this word out. And presentations like this help us get this word out. So we want to thank you, Jim, for that. Thank you. And by the way, this presentation uh, will be posted on our website uh, at some point and we can, uh, and if there, anybody had any uh, uh, video problems in the beginning of the video, we apologize for that. Uh, but we'll, we'll clean it up and make sure that the video is all, so there was just one little segment at the beginning. I, it was my computer, maybe nobody else's. Um, okay. it's, thank you for the, uh, the history on the gold medal and, and, uh, and, um, and uh, that, 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 movement of 422 to zero. That's a great vote. <laughs> um, uh, coincidentally, Jim, if I can, uh, the women of the 6th AAA, that's the all African American women uh, postal battalion, they were just approved for the Congressional Gold Medal themselves. And I work with Colonel Army, U.S. Army Colonel Edna Cummins. When their bill went to the floor, the vote was 422 to zero. How about that? Yeah, there you go. Um, cool. Uh, let's uh, switch gears a little bit, uh, Dr. Everhart. Can we talk about the Monfort Point Monument in Jacksonville. Okay, um, so the Monfort Point, and I often call it that um, our crown jewel of the East Coast. Our association was committed to accomplishing what I deemed at that time uh, our number one priority, and that was for the preservation of the Monfort Point Marine legacy. We initiated a nationwide, I mean a nationwide campaign to raise $1.8 million to build this historic monument to honor our heroes. The challenge to accomplish our goals require financial support from everyone. And I mean, the city of Jacksonville, you know, citizens from across the country supported uh, this initiative. We ensured the erection of this monument, which now serves to honor the sacrifices, the dedication and perseverance and bravery of the 20,000 African Americans who trained at the hollow grounds of Count Marple Point and fought for the right to fight. You know, when I think about this monument, and I think about all the work. What I'm most proud of today, you know, is that we finished this project eight years ahead of schedule, you know, which is unbelievable, you know, but it, it goes back to our, our motto, working together works. And I'm so proud of our association members for all that they did in regard to that, that monument. When it first started out, um, it was going to be a monument with three, a replica also of, three, uh, you know, uh, we call it the three-headed monument, you know, basically. But I wanted, when I took this to my executive committee back then, you know, I stated that I thought we should have a monument that was inclusive, that more so represented the 20,000 African-Americans 
who trained at the Hollow Grounds. And I and I tell you, if you guys just go there and look it up, you know, I think uh, you you will be also proud of that monument as well. I know I am. Um, doctor, I read online that the monument had three concentric circle patterns, which it said represent the ripples of influence that changes a nation. These ripples were caused by the Montford Point Marines, the U.S. Marine Corps, and the American public. What was the concept behind that? You know, just the concept that, again, we're talking about all-inclusive, all that the Montford Point Marines had endured at the segregated camp uh, during 1942 to 1941, all that they had achieved during the Korean War, uh, directly after World War II, and then on into Vietnam. And to, so our last Montford Point Marines served on active duty and retired after 30 years uh, in, from the Vietnam. And he served in the Vietnam area era as well. So, you know, we, we want to just talk about, again, something to be representative of those, those Montford Pointers and all that they did for social justice and change in our nation. Thank you. Uh, besides the monument, can you tell us a little about the National Museum? No. Um, so in dealing with the, the museum, you know, we're looking at doing a grand reopening at the end of this month, the 28th through the 30th of, uh, of January. Our museum basically, you know, have, is compiled of uh, artifacts and materials and historical documentation that we have uh, accumulated over the years. And, and this actually started on Joe Gieter's watch when he was uh, the national president during that time frame, he initiated this, this effort. And what we have done now so far is built upon that legacy by just collecting artifacts and documents and, you know, uh, memorabilia from those Montford Pointers who wanted their legacy to continue. So they have helped with this, uh, this project. You know, a couple of years ago, there was a hurricane at, in Jacksonville, North Carolina, which kind of destroyed the Montford Pointer. We were able to salvage a, the majority of the, those artifacts and what we've been doing over the last year, uh, there's been a complete renovation of the, uh, the museum. And what we've done is um, we're preparing for the grand reopening, as I stated, the 28th and through the 30th of, of this month. Interesting. Um, the, um, what is the most sought after museum artifact you think the curators wow. are looking for? <laughs> wow. You know, if, if a Montfort Point Marine owned that uh, memorabilia, it's important yeah. to us. There's no one over another. And I would say we would take whatever, you know, boots, uh, K bars, rifles, you know, whatever they have, you know, we will, you know, that they want to donate and family members want to donate, we would take. We would, we would love to have journals and uh, photos. We, and I know, Joe, we love the photos. And more so, especially if the names are identified with the picture. We would love to have that. So that can help tell the story as well. And we have some great work that uh, we're doing there at the museum in Jacksonville at this time. Okay, following up on what uh, Joe spoke yeah, about. Yeah, if I can here. too. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. I uh, first want to make sure we understand that the museum is in Jacksonville, North Carolina. We kept saying Jacksonville. I don't want to confuse it with Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, but when we <laughs> talked about sought after items, uh, Dr. Everhart is right on point. Uh, pictures with captions on them are rare because the, the photographers, the white photographers that took pictures of the Moffat Porters, specifically in combat, uh, didn't stick around for a long time to say, what's your name and unit? Uh, so many uh, pictures that we think are pretty famous, uh, most of them don't have captions on it. So if we get pictures uh, with names on them, and I got one, Dr. Everhart, you're hearing this for the first time. I got one in the mail yesterday that identified four Moffat Porters with, with three of the four names on there. But I think the most sought after item uh, is the Blue Book. Uh, and the Blue Book is the platoon Blue Book that recruits normally receive uh, kind of automatically nowadays. It's red nowadays, but it was blue for the Moffa Pointers. And many Moffa Pointers couldn't afford to buy it because you had to buy it. It was probably just a couple of dollars, but in 1942, a couple of dollars is a couple of dollars. Um, so there's not too many of these Blue Books or recruit training books available. Uh, so when we find one, it's a rare find. Uh, I'm very, very fortunate to have one in my possession that's going to end up in the museum. But but like Dr. Everhart says, we'll take any artifacts from any model for pointers or their families uh, that wants to donate to the museum. And if they choose to, uh, we will just hold that for them where they, if they want it back, they can have it back. So we don't, we don't want to commit or if we need to make a copy of it, we can make a copy of it. But we're actually still waiting. Dr. Everhart is going to be in Jacksonville, North Carolina at the end of the month, as well as myself 
and many, many other members and quite a few month appointments we're hearing are going to be there. So we're really looking forward to 28, 29, and 30 April in Jacksonville, North Carolina to reopen this museum that was seriously damaged by Hurricane Florence. Thank you. Uh, back to you, Dr. Everhart. And following up on a question I talked to Joe about earlier about how, how challenging is the search to find Montford point, pointers in terms of uh, just not just getting the word out about how significant and, and important this, this was, but just getting the word out and having them raise their hand and say, I'm here. Yeah. Or their yeah. other families, you know, their relatives, their, their daughters, sons, grandsons, granddaughters. You know, Jim, this is, uh, as stated, uh, that's a great question. And thank you again for that question. In that, what I see from my, from my platform is that a lot of people don't know that the Marine Corps is the last branch of service to accept African-Americans in the ranks, first and foremost. A lot of times when those, what I'm finding, we have found out that when those monthly pointers got out the Marine Corps, they wanted absolutely nothing to do with the Marine Corps. They just disappeared back in their hometowns uh, and whatever else, what they was doing. So to, you know, as Joe mentioned, I put out a PSA uh, uh, last year and calling for doing an all call. And it's events like we're doing today that someone may, may, may see and may remember that their grandfather or their father served in the Marine Corps during 1942 or more so during World War II. That's most of how it's identified that their grandfather served, a father served in World War II. And if he was a Marine, nine times out of 10, he was a month appointed. So as Joe mentioned previously as well, that whenever we do a congressional gold medal ceremony and the news get behind this initiative and they push it out and on the internet, uh, the local newspaper, uh, it's a, always a big stir. And someone, it will catch the eye, someone that remember their grandpa or their, their father, and they contact the association. Uh, I mostly direct them to Joe so he can watch that out for me. Uh, he figured it out. He'll send that information to me. I will verify and validate it. And, you know, what I try to do is get the uh, certificate uh, and the Congressional Gold Medal in the hands of that month appointer, especially that month appointment Marine, if he's still alive. And, you know, because tomorrow's not promised. And so... You know, we, we would definitely like to try to identify and we just do great media uh, campaigns just doing all calls. We constantly keep it on. We utilize social media, something that wasn't around many years ago. We utilize social media. Um, and I know Joe, as uh, my public relations officer, he checks it daily. Several times throughout the day, he'll check in the media, uh, emails and such to see what's out there. And, you know, so we can locate individuals who are multiple corners. And speaking of getting the word out, um, there, there was a movie, there is a movie project that it, I assume it got held up by COVID. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, not necessarily COVID, um, mm -hmm. mainly because the filmmaker that we've been working with was working on another movie project. Uh, so we've been working on uh, the tentative or working title of this movie. It's called Black Boots. And your viewers can Google Black Boots, the movie, and it will show you where we are with the movie project. Um, quickly, we were introduced to uh, Roger Mick Kamore. He's a filmmaker. Uh, Dr. Everhart and I met him. Dr. Everhart, it's hard to believe, almost 10 years ago, uh, back in 2012. And we started on, um, on the project probably the next year, 2013. So we've been working on this project for about nine years now. Uh, we develop a whole bunch, when I say a whole bunch, uh, maybe 100 interviews of living Moffa pointers to develop composite characters um, for the movie. Uh, it's going to be uh, mainly fictional. It's not going to be documentary. We have did that twice. We've done that twice. Uh, the last one with Lou Gossett providing our voice in Marines fighting for freedom back in 2006. But this is, we're hoping it's going to be a major movie uh, project. And it's still going to take a little bit more time. And when people are kind of anxious and they ask, well, how long is it going to take? Uh, I kind of remind them that George Lucas, the individual behind the Star Wars uh, fame, um, started on his project, Red Tails, uh, in 1988, uh, that movie did not come to the big screen until February 2012. So unfortunately, it took him 24 years with all the money and fame he has. Uh, we hope it doesn't take us 24 years, but we're moving right along. We're starting to move into the capital campaign uh, to raise money for it. Uh, the website at um, uh, Black Boots, the movie, 
uh, is very informative. Some of the working partners are myself, Dr. Everhart, uh, his former national vice president, James Carr, and our current webmaster, Gilbert uh, Taylor. Uh, the four of us are all 25 years or more members of the association. We all rose to the top of our enlisted or officer ranks. Uh, we've all got about 25 or 30 years with the association and the Marine Corps. So the four of us, we call ourselves the, the four horsemen of the Moffa Point. And between the four of us, uh, we have a lot of knowledge about what we want in the movie. And we do have a screenplay that was written by a uh, screenwriter out of Brooklyn, New York. Uh, so we're just trying to put all that together now and raise the money. And hopefully very soon before the last Moffa Pointer takes his last breath, that they'll be able to go to the movies and see uh, a depiction of their service on the big screen. Thank you very much. That's, um, that's a great project and we wish you the best. Uh, I understand maybe that, uh, maybe is Mr. Spielberg available perhaps? Uh, <laughs> well, it's funny you should say his name because when we first got word that Steven Spielberg was making the movie Flags of Our Father uh, with Clint Eastwood directing, uh, we, re we reached out to him and kind of reminded him, hey, you kind of blew it and save it Private Ryan. Uh, you had an opportunity to show maybe the Marines of the, um, uh, I'm sorry, the Marines, the Army uh, that landed on Normandy on the 6th of June, 1944. And, and nobody in that movie, uh, except for Van Diesel, maybe he even looked like us. So we wrote him and I sent him a, a, just a plethora, a whole package of information, uh, although he never responded. If you look at the movie Flags of Our Father, about 12 or 13 minutes in the movie, you see the Marines um, um, on, the, on the ships outside of Iwo Jima and a white officer turns to the black Marines and he says, 8th Ammo Company, you land at Red Beach. And I almost fell out of my chair when he said that because that's the exact information that I sent to Steven Spielberg and Clint Eastwood. So when Spike Lee and Clint Eastwood were going back and forth about no blacks in the movie, we wanted to tell Spike to kind of be quiet because we were in the movie, uh, uh, albeit for just a very, very short period of time. But, but we got we got not even a leg in, we got a toe in. Uh, but we're trying to get our whole body into this Black Boots movie project. Uh, before we get close to wrapping up and maybe taking some questions, can you tell us uh, how folks can find out more about the Mount Mumford Pointers? Uh, well, the main platform is our website. Uh, Gilbert Taylor, who I just mentioned, he's a retired Master Gunnery Sergeant, a Hall of Fame member of our association. He manages our website. And Gilbert, if I know Gilbert, he's doing some managing right now. Uh, so the website is fresh. It's easy to negotiate. It's fan-friendly or user-friendly, as they say. Uh, and if you Google Moffa Point Marines, that website will be one of the first ones. And I saw that somebody shared it in the chat. Thank you for that. Uh, that's our main vehicle. We're active on Facebook. Uh, many of our members are active on Instagram as well. So we're constantly getting the word out there. But our website continues to be the number one place that we guide people to for information about the Moffa Point Marines. Thank you. Uh, Joe, I can't, uh, can't go without asking this question. Uh, tell me about the, uh, the things on your wall behind you. I see a sword and... Uh... Uh, well, the whole, um, I'm upstairs and I'm in my bedroom and as Marines, uh, and a lot of people may not understand this, but um, service people really occupy bases overseas, uh, pretty much the same bases that we fought for in World War II. So that's why you see a lot of Army bases in Europe and in Germany. But in the Pacific, you see mainly Marine Corps bases in Okinawa, Guam, and, and islands like that. And I spent four tours of duties overseas at these various bases, and I've collected a lot of uh, Far East art and fans and pictures and and stuff like that. So uh, I kind of decorated my room with it. When I moved in here, the room was already a jade green. Uh, so that kind of helped me out with the uh, the Far Eastern flavor. So there's a lot of Far Eastern stuff. The only thing in my room that's military is a picture uh, on the wall here that was taken at our 2007 con uh, convention. That was the year that we met Anthony Tony Hill. He was a state of Florida state senator at the time. And he is the guy that uh, really guided me and the association in the right direction to start the Congressional Gold Medal Ceremony. So when I was upstairs laboring uh, for four years lobbying and setting up for my next trip to D.C., I would look at that picture and look at all those Moffa Pointers in the picture. And it's about, believe it or not, about 60 Moffa Pointers in that picture. And every now and again, we kind of look through it and find out who's still living or not. And every time I thought I was being overwhelmed with work or I was just too busy to do something, I would turn around and look at that picture and I would say, I can't let these guys down. So that's the only picture in my room that has Moffa Point. Everything else, uh, Dr. Everhart knows, my entire basement is in a museum, uh, mainly dedicated to the Moffa Point. There's tons of artifacts and pictures and videos and, and just a lot of stuff down in that basement. 
uh, to remind me why we're doing this. And this is what I do uh, every day. I'm retired from my regular job, retired from the Marine Corps after 25 years, retired from my civilian job after 18 years. So this is what I do. Uh, every day I work on my point and I love it. That's great. Uh, doctor, you have any uh, thoughts as we get close to wrapping up or perhaps uh, Weston, West, we're gonna take a few questions or anything queued up? You know, um, I was thinking about, uh, you know, just listening to Joe talk. That was a great walk down memory lane. I remember that was several initiatives that we was working on, and whether it was the Congressional Gold Medal, it was the monument, it was the ship, uh, USNS Month Point that uh, we worked on. And there's all kinds of uh, initiatives to help with the preservation of the legacy. But what I'm reminded of, and I often say as well, that Everyone, everyone know about the Tuskegee Airmen, the Buffalo Soldiers, the Navy's Golden 13, but no one know about the Montville Point Marine. But that time is vastly changing in that this is not just Black history or Marine Corps history. This is American history, and the world need to know about the Montville Point Marine. So it's about time that they take their rightful place, and we can't do it by ourselves. We are, we're calling for partners. We're calling for you. We're calling for your membership, you know, to help us with this endeavor. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Ava Hart. Um, and yes, we actually do have a couple of questions. Uh, Nick, we have a question from Nicole. I'm going to uh, unmute her so that she can ask her question directly. Nicole? Hi, good morning, gentlemen. Or it's very, it's early in the morning here on Guam. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, so enlightening. Um, I have a couple of questions. First of all, and forgive me for my ignorance, um, what exists now at Montfort Point Camp? What is there on that campsite? Dr. Everhart, I'll let you handle it. Go ahead. Okay, so on the very campsite, the hollow grounds of Camp Martha Point, there stands the monument. I mean, I'm sorry, the memorial uh, uh, in the museum. You know, that, that station on the very hollow ground. You know, if you see a lot of pictures, old pictures from 1942, and a replica of the Congressional Gold Medal, you will see the water tower there. And that's Joe's favorite part of the camp, I know. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. the, the museum is actually on the very camp and the monument is outside the gates of the camp, you know, the entrance. So that's what's still left at the base. It's a lot of old barracks and they still do active duty training there uh, for the logistic and motor T for active duty Marines now. So it's still a logistic base there, a training base more so for entry level. Okay. And it was, in addition to that, it was renamed. It was Montfort Point Camp, and in April, April 19th, 1974, it was renamed Camp Johnson after Sergeant Major Gilbert Hashmark Johnson, who was mentioned in the video. And it stood then, I believe it still stands now as I speak, as the only African-American um, only base named after an African-American Marine. So it's the only one. So Camp Johnson is still viable, as Dr. Everhart said, as a school's base to teach combat service support. And how coincidental is that? Because the Montfort Point Marines were mainly logisticians. They brought along ammo, uh, supply, depot companies. Uh, so they teach young Marines that today. So we're, we're very proud of Camp Johnson and I'm looking forward to being on those grounds on, on April 29th. That's wonderful, fantastic. I could, my next question was, is the site um, part of the, the National Registry for Historic Places? Good question. Uh, and I know Dr. Everhart during his presidency, mine and my predecessor, uh, President Emeritus Nathaniel James, um, although the entire base is not, uh, we're working to have a few buildings there recognized. Unfortunately, one of those buildings, the chapel, was very much, it was totally destroyed uh, during Florence. So the, the base right now is trying to um, um, uh, salvage as many of those pieces of plank wood as they can to rebuild it. Uh, but there are three other um, buildings there now that we're working to get that on the National Register of Historical Places. But the overwhelming majority of those buildings are gone now. I understand. Very good. Gentlemen, I am from Guam, and I'm, when you were talking about Saipan, I'm leaving to Saipan tomorrow morning, and ah. I, I want to invite you guys to Guam and Saipan, if you would, you know, and I, I'll try to find a way to connect with you. I'm part of Pacific Historic Parks, but I am on the Guam, the Guam team and the Saipan team, and um, it's amazing. You're right. You're, our, this is part of our history, and I think so many people on the islands would love to learn more about it. Unfortunately for us, it was like a six o'clock a.m. Zoom. <laughs> I I'm committed to my organization, so I did. But um, I think this is right. amazing, and I'd love to be able to 
reach out with you to do other presentations for the people on the islands to learn more about this very important part of our history? Well, please do. We actually have a member on Guam, a retired Marine Colonel. His name is Chuck Ellis. Uh, Chuck yeah. Ellis is actually the son of the second <clears throat> African-American woman uh, to enlist in the Marine Corps, <clears throat> excuse me, and a Moffa Point Marine, Master Gunnery Sergeant Charles Ellis. Uh, they had a son who um, entered the Marine Corps and uh, uh, made to the rank of Colonel. And he retired on Guam. So Colonel Ellis and I are working, and we know the Marines are currently um, looking to relocate some major units from Okinawa to Guam. And we right. want to make sure the Moffa Pointers are remembered there, specifically Luther Woodward, uh, who I mentioned earlier, a Silver Star recipient for actions on Guam. There should be a Luther Woodward Street way building something there. Uh, so Chuck Ellis is very important. So if you can, if you want to, you can reach out with me um, through West or anybody else, and we can connect there, okay? Thank you very much. I appreciate that, and have a great day. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, gentlemen. I, I actually have one more question, and um, this is actually for both of you. Uh, what would be your message to young Americans regarding the Montford Point Marines and their service to this country? Dadera, you want to go first, or you want me to go first? <laughs> you want to go first, so I'll close it. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you what, uh, my message, and, and I delivered it as, as soon as yesterday uh, to a young African-American recruiter, a staff sergeant, female, uh, and she knew very little about the Moffa Point. She kind of knew about it, but didn't know about it. So my message is to do your research. Uh, we all have these smartphones in the palm of our hands, and we spend too much time playing games with them instead of using them for what they can be used for. And that's to find out um, answers to your questions. So I tell folks, just Google Moffa Point. Uh, Google Moffa Point and come up with the news, come up with the video. You'll be amazed what's out there. Uh, we're trying to get it more out to the public, but right now uh, we have scholarships uh, that we award every year. And part of that scholarship process is the applicant must write an essay about Moffa Point. And I've seen some incredible essays from high school students, want to be college students, and even a little seven-year-old girl in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Her dad reached out to me a couple of years ago and she wanted to do a project for her school on a, on a poster board, a three-pronged poster board about Moffa Point. And she did it and got an A in her class and she was so excited. So we really like to engage the youth. Uh, we're working on a graphic novel right now uh, that we signed a contract with, with Oxford Press uh, to go in the school's district. And we're gonna start off big. We're gonna start off in New York. Uh, and we think this graphic novel, once introduced to the schools, will give these young folks an early introduction to some of these uh, American heroes like the Moffa Pointers. Dr. Everhart. You know, in order to know where you're going, you have to know from which you came. You know, we have 42 chapters uh, nationwide, and we would love to have a, a chapter in Guam as well, Nicole. Yeah. So, <laughs> so what I simply say that, you know, we believe in educating. You know, we, we travel, we educate all those, anyone that asks, we, we eagerly seek to educate the, the literature tree of the Moffa Point Marine story because we truly stand on the shoulders of those giants, you know. Um, and so they, they are true trailblazers and pioneers, and they paved the way for thousands. So I'm truly honored in that regards. But I, in order to know, again, you have to, we have to learn about their history and tell their history. And that's what I advocate for. Amen. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Avar. Thank you, Joe. Um, I couldn't say that message any more clear. You know, that's exactly what we um, say to everyone here when they come to Pearl Harbor. It's like you have to understand history so that we can grow as a nation and as people as well, too. Um, so I do want to say, you know, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, please visit, you know, momfordpointmarine.org um, or visit their museum reopening at the end of this month, you know, in Jacksonville, yeah. North Carolina. So yeah. make sure that's clear, everyone, Jacksonville, North Carolina. Yeah. And on behalf of Pacific Historic Parks, we'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, a recording yeah. of this presentation will be made available in the coming weeks. Um, but before signing off, I'd like to unmute uh, to allow everyone to thank uh, Dr. Averhart and Joe as well for their participation and continuing to honor their history uh, for everyone who served at Montford Point. So. I'm going to ask everyone to unmute and you can all say thank you at this time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Mahalo. Mahalo.